encampment. A soldier's life, a soldier's life, a soldier's life for me. A soldier's life, a soldier's life, a soldier I shall be. The song's tune played on like that in Gerald's mind as he stood, awaiting instruction. His legion was the 10th legion, his men were the strongest and the most skillful, though perhaps they were not his men. He was but a soldier, not the commander, after all, though he often vied for the position, or would if he ever had an opportunity. He suspected that there were roughly two or three dozen other men who would could take such position from his commander, Commander Lurus, but led them steadily, who led them steadily, and it was not so much that he did not like the man. In fact, he adored him, but still he wanted to be him more than anything he could ever dream of wanting. For now, he thought steadily he must follow, so that perhaps one day he might lead. At least, that was his aspiration before everything changed. In but a moment, the commander, Commander Lurus, appeared from his red tent, colored brightly and laced in golden hues around its corners and edges. He wore a long red cape, embroidered gold, and a coat of armor, that of which only the finest of the men wore, though none, of, though none wore anything quite as elegant as his. Stepping out onto the small piece of land in front of the tent, which was elevated, literally made to be more like a hill, two men had dug out holes next to it and piled the dirt on top of it so that it stood out as a crescent. On top of it, there was a podium of sorts, crafted from fine wood, made it in the capital, not far from where they camped, perhaps fifty miles or so, or a few days' walk, if they were slow, which they wouldn't be. They carted that hunk of wood around everywhere, the commander and his guards, of which Gerald was one, Gerald was not the strongest or the most skilled of the guard, but most of the men as a whole he was. But of the of the men as a whole he was, of the best obviously. Else he would not have been chosen. He was but nine and twenty years old, the youngest of the guard, the oldest of forty, year old named Lenneth. He himself had seen many of the guards serve and then die, of course, but so had any given man in the legion. They had begun as ten thousand, but now they were but three. Three thousand men and none left to fight. They had petitioned the commander to return home. The fight, it seemed, had become a useless endeavor. Their toils without merit, and their spirits hashed and tossed aside. They returned home now, not to a welcoming crowd or a happy master, but an angry mob and a spiteful ruler. In fact, the ruler, Ruler Rigus, Riber Rigus, would most certainly punish them. How well, how well the commander perhaps would tell them just now. As the commander prepared to speak, Gerald grew tense. He would not want to hear what his ears would surely listen to, and the other men, though some calmer than others, perhaps they had accepted their fate, perhaps some of them, their spirits really were that broken, seemed less so and more relaxed. Instinctively, Gerald's eyes went to his scabbard, as if he were preparing for battle, as he and the others had done so many times, though he knew that he would have no need of it where he was going if he were not killed or if he were killed. Probably, he thought, the military in the capital would take him as the emperor commanded, though one would only hope that they could and would sympathize with the legion's plight, and their inability to cope in the fray, and some of the younger men in the legion believed this. But Gerald knew. He knew that they were condemned. He knew that when they returned, what would most likely happen to them would be death, some of them to make an example, and for the rest it would be a life of enslavement of some kind. Some would be common workers, some skilled, but none would be serfs even, or yet indentured servants with a capability to pay back a debt in order to restore citizenship. No. They would lose all rights upon return, but return they would. Why? Because it was their home, and they wanted to make a point about the fighting in the western lands. A point that would not be made if but one man left the legion, and none did. Not one. All were accounted for, all knew the plan, and whether or not they agreed with it, together they would stand in front of the ruler to await their fate there in the capital. Commander Lurus took a breath, and at that moment it seemed that the entire legion too took a breath, though only about a thousand were present. The rest were resting, and then he began, Commander Lurus. Brothers, tonight I say to you this, we are going home. There was no cheer. Brothers, I tonight also tell you this. Our ruler, Ruler Rigus, who we know and who we all love, he stated through gritted teeth, has commanded that if we return home that we will be... He paused a moment. Well, I'll just tell you outrightly. There was a pause. If we go home, he said, we will be slaves and worse, he said as if reserving a last bit for himself, as he knew that he would likely be executed. 
Brothers, I will not blame you, he continued. I will not blame you if you leave the Legion tonight, if you wish to find your families, if you still can. And I am sorry, brothers, for what may be their fate. If you still wish to find them and make your way in other lands, though we know that the western lands are there forsaken, you may do what you will. There was a long pause, and none of the men spoke, none of the men so much as breathed. There was silence. And then Commander Luris rejoined his speech. For the men who stay, we will face this challenge head on, and we will overcome. We will show the men and women of the capital that this war, along with its people, is not worth its bloodshed. There is no dispute on that matter, I know not in this legion, he said, eyeing the men as if to check for any sign of it. This war, he continued, must end. Some of the men nodded, grunting, but there was no cheer. The war had taken all of the cheer from these men. Gerald included, who hung his head solemnly as he listened, nodding along to the speeches, proverbial rhythm. He wanted the people of the capital to see this, more than perhaps anyone, but he knew that there would be no place, no opportunity for a speech therein when they arrived there. He would be incapable of speech surely when they sold him into slavery, but he would go with the others nonetheless. That was the end of his speech. Commander Lewis returned to his bright tent, which seemed to stand still in the backdrop that was the dark, cloudy sky behind. It was dawn and night was befalling the camp encampment. In the morning, surely, Gerald thought, surely something would make sense to him, though he knew that nothing would. He would return home to his home, and surely the people there would condemn him. Perhaps he thought warily, perhaps it was not his any longer. No, but it was. There was nowhere else. Nowhere else worth going, and to leave the Legion, he simply could not. No, they would face this challenge together as together as they could be as slaves or dead. Gerald stood to return to his tent, one of the tents near as the commander, but as he entered he realized that he could not bear to be alone thinking. He removed his armor and in plain, plain clothing as the other men would be, entered the heart of the encampment where normally the men jested, played games, and drank, but there was nothing to celebrate this night as many men sat contemplating, awaiting their fate. Few spoke, though some did, None spoke of mutiny, at least not around Gerald. As he passed by, the men who knew him, which were most, nodded their head at him in approval. Some willingly, others nudged. There was a sense of division in the heart of it, the heart of the encampment. Some of the men wanted to leave to take their chances elsewhere, and many of the men, it was true, did not have families to return to. Gerald, however, of course, he did, a wife and a daughter, and if he did not return home, perhaps they would be executed, if they had not already had the wits to leave, which perhaps they had, or perhaps they had decided to wait his return. He hoped they had left. The men, despite this division, did not budge, but rather sat themselves down, condemned now, awaiting their trial. Some of the men spoke of whom might be executed and, he might, and who might be spared, sold into slavery. Ha, huh, Gerald thought, or given to slavery, but no, of course they would be sold. It was unfortunate, he thought, but he would bear this burden with dignity, as much dignity as he could. As he walked around the encampment now, and night truly began to fall, he made his way back to his tent, now to think his energies somewhat depleted, so that he could relax more easily as he did so. His mind wandered here and there for but moments before he found the courage and the strength necessary to continue his thought. It was a difficult thing to think of, what was to come, but by the time he came to, around to thinking of it, he soon after fell fast to sleep. When he awoke, it was nearly daybreak. He could see from the slit in his tent, though not quite. The sun could not yet be seen, but the sky was brightening, and there, there on the hill in the distance, he thought he saw something. A rider, it appeared. Gerald stood up rather quickly for someone who'd just awoken, some, something he'd grown accustomed to as a soldier in the Legion, and walked towards the entrance of the tent. What would a rider be doing? Gerald mumbled to himself, mumbled to himself before he saw. His eyes widened. There on the hill over the encampment was an army. Oh no, Gerald said, though he did not yell. Quickly instead he made his way to his commander's tent. The army must have noticed as it began to advance slowly, but nonetheless advancing towards the encampment. He entered hastily to a guard's sword. Gerald looked at him. It was Rickus. Rickus, he said. Gerald said, said Rickus, through hushed breath. What are you doing in here? There's an army, Gerald spoke plainly, outside. We must tell the commander. Where is he? Rickus, a tall, brawny man, looked over at the empty bed and shook his head. Go back to your tent, Gerald. What do you mean? Gerald asked, bewildered. The armory is coming now. Where is the commander? 
The commander is gone, Rickus said. Now go back to your tent. You will be spared along with me. Zero looked at him fearfully. And the men? Rickus merely shook his head. Go now, quickly. He grabbed a hold of Gerald, who did not nothing to resist, and pushed him outside of the tent. Gerald, once outside, noted the army advancing forward, went back to his tent, and began to pray. Father, mother, he prayed, deliver me from these depths, and deliver my men, if you can, from these depths. He could hear the men screaming outside, but to interfere he knew was sure death. The army vastly outnumbered them. They had the element of surprise, and the men of the Legion would not be able to confront such a force head-on and win. He prayed that the men would get out alive, some of them at least, and some surely would. The wittier of the bunch, he sighed as they entered his tent. Yelling, they told Gerald to drop his sword and knife, which were already placed on the ground next to him. Gerald had assumed that they would take him. They knew, they knew which tents to strike and which to spare. When they took him, they bound him in chains, his wrists and, wrists and ankles, and marched him along the dirt into a cart surrounded by a steel cage, which was bolted into the woodwork. They slammed the metal door to the cage shut after him, though he did not flinch. He'd recognized none of them, but inside of the cart he recognized a few members of the guard, who seemed to be upset, reasonably, Gerald thought, except that they weren't upset about their capture. Some men, too, actually had stowed away of sorts, pretending to be members of, of the commander's guard. They must have killed them, which admittedly should have enraged Gerald, but it did not. It was clever. Three of the remainder of the guards, as there were nine men total in the cart, were shouting at the men outside to take these men out to execute them, but Gerald figured that it would come nonetheless, and so calmly sat down next to one of the commander's guards, who looked forward, eyes heavy. His right hand was shaking. Froshin, Gerald said. Gerald, Froshin said without moving his eyes, though his hand still shook quite momentously. Gerald let out a calm sigh. Neither of his hands shook. In fact, everything felt very tranquil to him, despite the shouting and the killing that surrounded him. In the end, we were all dead men, Froshin, he said. All of us. The song that played in his head from the day prior did play again.